Everybody has fears. Everybody's got worries. Oh, oh, oh. everybody knows sorrow, devastation. Oh, oh. This is truth right here. But we can lay our burdens down. We can lay our burdens down. Oh, Up and praise this morning, church. I invite you to greet your neighbor with the love of Christ this morning. Give a handshake or a hug. If you would remain standing as we join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as our guide, I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It's great to see all of you this morning. I want to welcome you all to worship. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. It's an honor to serve alongside you here in this community. Uh, There are two cards in the seat backs in front of you. I'm new card and a prayer card. If you're new with us, I hope that you'll fill that out. We'd love to reach out to you and welcome you with the love of Christ. Uh, If you have a prayer on your heart today, we would love to come alongside you in that prayer And I hope that you will put either of those in the offering plate as they're passed later in worship. I have a couple of invitations just want to alert you to. The first is that uh, we have our Young Minds Conference uh, this coming Saturday. It's an opportunity for parents who have kids, uh, infant through sixth grade, to learn how we can support and love and care for our kids in this tumultuous time so that they could uh, be healthy and whole uh, as they're being raised by us poor things. And I checked the football schedule and uh, it's, it's, it's good. Like we're perfect, right? This is a morning uh, and uh, all, all the afternoon games are going to be great and you're going to want to be there. And here's the one thing I know about covenant, you procrastinate, okay? But here's the, here's the truth of the matter. Today's the last day. So if you've been waiting to see what better offer, you know, Uh, you had coming. You will have no better offer coming, and this is the day. I hope that you'll go ahead and sign up. It will uh, enrich and bless your life.
life and the life of your family. I hope that you'll sign up. We also have um, just a, a word around uh, our children's ministries. I announced, I don't know, some six weeks ago probably that we were heading towards uh, a season of transition as we celebrate and mourn uh, Patricia, who's been with us uh, for 11 years as our director of children's ministries, as she pursues her call to follow the Lord in teaching in the classroom across the street at Creekside Park Junior High, by the way. And uh, so um, we are about to enter into a transitional season. Uh, in the month of October and November, we need you. We need volunteers to help support the ministry uh, while we're in this in-between space. We need less leads, activity leads. We need two assistants every Sunday for the 1030 service. I hope that you will go on to this uh, sign up and you'll say, you know what? I could be an assistant or I can be an activity lead. Or if you're a really special person, then you would say, I'll be a lesson lead. And no pressure on the special person part. But we would really appreciate you stepping forward to serve. Uh, even our students can help. Uh, by the way, students, I mean youth can help to serve as assistants. Uh, you, you could come at the 9 o'clock and serve and still worship with your family at 1030. You could say, hey, I could do this once or twice over the next two months and serve and create space for the other people in the community to worship. I hope that you'll find a way to step forward as we lean in together as a community of faith, making a way for our kids to continue to connect with Christ in such a rich way through our children's ministries, through Cuff Kids. Uh, let's go to God in prayer together as a church. Lord, we come to you this morning uh, to worship you. We don't just come to worship, we come to worship. And so we ask God that you would be honored and glorified through, uh, through the way in which we, we focus our attention on you, the way in which we set the things of this world, the things that, uh, that, that are distractions aside. And yet we enter into this space bringing our whole selves knowing that there are parts of us that need healing, parts of us that need repair, parts of us that need to be sent and given purpose. And so, Lord, we pray that you would anoint this space, adorn this space with the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that, that we would uh, know who you are amongst us through this time of worship. We pray, Lord, a, a hedge of protection around this space that, uh, that there would be uh, no harm that would come, but only glory offered in your name. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in worship, just reminding ourselves this is a place of freedom. Feel free to sit or to stand, but we're going to rejoice in our testimonies, our story that God came, Jesus came to save. We can have freedom in that, amen. Let's prepare our hearts and let's sing. I saw sin fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders, I have a resurrection power, still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name He's registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God, 
will finish what he started. Our God will finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Because Grace Tree wrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is true. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. We rejoice in our stories and our testimonies and in a response church we declare that we will build our lives upon his love that he is our solid rock he is our firm foundation on which we stand as we worship as we sing we are declaring something we are declaring that we will build our lives upon him everything else is sinking sand Jesus, we choose to build our lives on you. We worship you, God. Together we lift up this song. We sing of your worthiness. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. If for you, oh. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show Worthy. worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Yes, we do, yes, we do Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you pray together, church. We're going to start just by listening, just asking the Lord, how do you want me to do this? What does this look like? How do you want me to build my life upon your love? Maybe just ask for just one tiny thing, one tiny hint of how we can step into that today.
Lord, help us to choose this. Help us to choose to build our lives upon you. To trust that you are the best thing to stand on. God, keep us open to your word this morning. We thank you that we get to worship you. We praise you, God. Be present in this time. We lift this all up in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people together said, amen. Amen. You can have a seat, church. And at this time, the kids are dismissed to go to Cove Kids to come around God's word together as children of God. This morning, our scripture is two-part. We're going to start in Exodus chapter 17, and then we're going to jump over to Numbers 20. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there with me. If not, the scriptures are on the screen behind me. Exodus chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness, that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring the water out of the rock for their community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, what a gift it is to be able to gather together as your people. We ask, oh God, that you would... um, Be with us in this space, in this time. We trust in you. Open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear. Open our minds that we would come to know and understand your word and your will. Our hearts that we would feel its power. Then in response, I ask that you would open our hands that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Have you ever had a severe case of deja vu? You might have just had it a few moments ago while Megan was reading. Um, no, like, like whenever you enter into a space or a conversation, it's something about the place or something about the way in which you're engaging with the people who you are with. And, and there you start to recall, did I dream this? Did this happen before? What am I to make of this recollection? Well, sometimes, uh, or maybe more often than it seems reasonable, we would have those instances in our home because my daughter Addison loves to tell stories. She just really loves to tell long, drawn-out stories. And there were moments in life where we would say, get to the point, right? Um, but but that, that wasn't always her strength, but her strength is storytelling. And whenever she found a story that she really loved, that she knew hit home, she would retell said story many times, um, Many, many times. Uh, and there, there were instances where you would uh, be sitting with her and she would start telling the same story again for the fourth or fifth time. And you just didn't have the heart to interrupt her again because you just wanted to see her tell her story. Sometimes things actually are the same. And other times, there are really distinct differences that we have to get clear on. And whenever we approach this particular text, uh, these two texts, in fact, uh, the very first question that's reasonable for us to ask as Bible scholars is, is this the same exact story? I mean, we, we have sometimes in First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, the same exact story just told from different pers perspectives. Many times in the Gospels, particularly the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whenever we read those, uh, those passages and parables of Jesus' teaching, uh, uh, we could hear the exact or near exact statements, phrases, or stories. And we come to know and understand that those are the same things just uh, told by different people with a different perspective on that same engagement. But there are other instances, even let's say in the Gospels, where you have to ask because Jesus did feed 4,000 and Jesus did feed 5,000. Because Jesus can feed four and 5,000. Jesus is not limited to one instances of feeding, Right? But it's always an appropriate question to come around like, is this the same exact story or is this different? And so when we come to Exodus and Numbers, fair enough, the answer is these are two different stories. Two different instances that happen in two different places at two different times. And us getting clear on that can help us grasp that there is an importance for our clarity in the distinctions. We also might wonder, is this the same place? Reasonable. One story is set in the desert of Zin, Z-I-N, and one story is set in the desert of Sin, S-I-N. And we might be wondering, did they just miss a letter? A jot or a tittle put in the wrong place can make just, you know, a drastic difference. Maybe this is the same place and we just have that nuanced difference. Because uh, the, of the location in the story, we know that whenever they're uh, in Exodus, they're near Mount Sinai at the base of Mount Sinai. And then as we approach the text in Numbers, they're closer to the border of the promised land. And, and so I don't believe it's the same place. Reasonable question though. It's also a reasonable question because both of the places in the end are called Meribah. Meribah, both of the places are called Meribah. And that's, that's confusing. Last week, I think it was, we talked about Antioch and Pisidian Antioch, both places in uh, the, the, the 
uh, region, which is now Turkey and Greece. And so for us to understand that those two places are different places is helpful. But Meribah and Meribah, are they two different places? Yes, they are. And that's easy for me to draw that conclusion for a few reasons. But the first is I was born in China. China, Texas. I was born in China, Texas. And so I know, and you probably don't know. Do you know where China is? China, yeah, okay. So it's like, it's Golden Triangle, Sour Lake. Uh, it's, it's, it's before Sour Lake on 90 on the way to Beaumont. Okay, so that's where I uh, spent my first five years of life. And I know that China doesn't necessarily mean China. I also know that hope doesn't necessarily mean hope. There's 26 hope cities in the United States of America. Did you know that? And I'm sure that someone at some point in time walked into the city and they said, this is good soil. This is a good place for my family. We are going to settle here and here we will have hope. Sounds good. Exactly what happened here in this text. In the first instance, they quarreled with God. And so they named their city quarreling, Mirabah. And then in the second instance, they quarreled with God. And so they named their city Quarreling. Okay, so two different places, two different times. But we need to then ask, what makes this deja vu for us? It feels like that because the situations are so incredibly similar. The situations are so incredibly similar. So let's walk through the two situations, see if we could uh, draw the, the similarities and in so doing also clarify the distinctions which will help us grasp the nuanced differences of conclusion of both stories. So in the first instance, we're here in Exodus. Uh, Exodus is uh, is the time frame after, uh, we're in the time frame after they had all already left the bondage of slavery in Egypt and they entered into the wilderness. And here they find themselves in the wilderness. And what do the people of God say? Thank you, God. You saved us from slavery. We're so grateful. Good job, God. No, they say, oh, we're thirsty. This is so awful. We should have just died. Why did you bring us here? Why did you bring our children here? Why did you bring our livestock here? Don't forget about the livestock. Uh, always something about the livestock. We're just all in despair because we're so dang thirsty. Reasonable. I mean, have you ever lived in... The Middle East and had no water? I imagine that would be pretty rotten. I imagine that you would be thirsty. But they had two different ways that they could approach this. God, thank you. Thank you for the ways you've blessed. Thank you for the ways you've sustained. Thank you for the ways that you've led. We see your provision. We trust in your provision. We're going to call upon your name and invite you to provide for us again. That would have been awesome. God, we would have gotten like two thumbs up, five gold stars. It would be fantastic. That's not what the people did. They complained. They complained to Moses. They complained so much to Moses that Moses goes to God. And, and, and I love this, this verse 4. It's like Moses is having buyer's remorse. Moses didn't want it. By the way, Moses didn't want to do any of this in, like, to start with. And ultimately, God just said, give up. You're the one. And so now Moses has led the people out of Egypt, thought that he was past the hard thing, <laughs> past Pharaoh and armies and death. But no, now he finds himself with the people of God. And in verse 4, it says, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, cried out to the Lord. What am I to do with these people? Like, Lord, you stuck me here with these people. I mean, it could have been other people. It could have been grateful people. It could have been obedient people. But you stuck me here with these people. And then he also says, they're almost ready to stone me, which has to be incredibly discouraging because their time in the wilderness was just beginning Moses just got to the wilderness with the people and he has buyer's remorse and he's tired of them and they're going to stone him. And so he goes to God and just submits his humble 
real plea before God. And all right, so here's what God says. God says, get together the elders, gather the assembly, and strike the rock with the staff you're going to take with you. So the same staff, you remember the staff that, that he touched the Nile River with, the same staff that, that, that he held up and people held his hands for him, the, the same staff that, that, that he then, that they crossed the, the water with, that same staff, take your staff, gather the elders, gather the assembly, and then strike the rock. And so what does Moses do? I love that, that the scripture doesn't even need to account for the precision of each detail of what Moses does because he just does it. No question, no quarreling, only obedience, only trust, only humility. And he follows each instruction of God. He takes his staff he gathers the assembly with the elders in front, and he doesn't say anything. He doesn't give a speech. He, literally, God gives a plan. He doesn't step to the left of that plan or to the right of that plan. He walks obediently exactly in accordance with God's plan. And what does the Lord do? After he strikes the rock, water flows and the people and their children and their livestock, don't forget the livestock, are all filled with water. Okay, so you would think lesson learned, right? Uh, we worship a God, a God who liberates those who are enslaved, a God who provides for those who are thirsty. And, and then provision continues throughout the story. We see manna from heaven that all of their, their food is provided for. We see ways in which God provides for the people to organize themselves, to stay healthy, to stay in community, to worship, to have their needs met. All of this is about orienting us in relationship to God so that the people, as they enter through the promise would not then think that the promise was of their own doing, but so that they would always know that they depend on the leading and the provision of God. Should have been, maybe, lesson learned. But we are stubborn. Humans are a tough crowd because we are stubborn. And so when we arrive in Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 15, and we hear now that the whole assembly of the Israelite people, hundreds of thousands of people with their children and their livestock, they've continued wandering through the wilderness, and now they are uh, in the wilderness of Zen. They find themselves there in Kadesh, and they are thirsty. So what do the people of God do when they're thirsty? God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for leading us out of bondage. We thank you for providing us water before. We thank you for providing all of our food. We trust in you. We submit to you. And we ask that you would humbly provide for us yet again today. <laughs> no, that would be like way too good. Like that would be again two thumbs up, five gold stars. They didn't get that. Instead, what did the people of God do? They groaned, oh God, we're so thirsty. We're gonna die, our kids are gonna die, our livestock's gonna die, don't forget the livestock, everybody's gonna die. We need water, we're so thirsty. <laughs> and, and so you have this radical moment where like, did this really happen again? Like, I thought that this was already resolved once. I thought they learned to trust God for provision for for drink, for water, but no, they didn't. So we find ourselves here in chapter 20 of Numbers, and we realize that Moses is stuck with this hard-headed people. So what does Moses do? 
Moses faithfully, as he did before, goes to God. This time he doesn't even have to talk to God. He doesn't even tell God what his problem is because he, he has learned at this point that God already knows his problem. So all he does, he goes to the tent of meeting, which didn't exist in uh, Exodus 17. He goes to the tent of the meeting and Aaron is there next to him and they just bow prostrate before the Lord. They just humble themselves as a sign of, God, we need you. This is, we need you. And so God gives instructions. The instructions are similar but different from the previous instructions. Take your staff, okay, and you and Aaron go. So instead of elders, it's just Aaron. So that's a nuanced difference. Not, subs, not, not, not grand, but substantive. And then it says, uh, gather the assembly, just like last time. And then it says, speak to the rock. God says, speak to the rock. Take your staff and speak to the rock. That's different. Last time, Moses was to strike the rock. Now he's to speak to the rock. So what does Moses do? All right. He takes his staff. Check. Well done. He gets with Aaron up front. Check. Two for two. He gathers the assembly of the people of God. Check. Three for three. He's on a roll. Here we go. And then he gives a big grand speech, not to the rock, but to the people. Strike one. And then instead of speaking the rock, he hits the rock. Strike two. And then he hits the rock a second time. Bam! Mm. Strike three. Moses was given very specific instructions to do a very specific thing to give God honor, glory, and praise in order for his work and will to be accomplished that his people might align their hearts to, to God's heart. That's the function of the wilderness. For the people of God and God to have one heart, to be one people. And instead, he decided that he was going to choose his own path. And so we hear this penalty. This penalty is, it seems drastic at first, uh, and, and it causes us to really go back and review, well, what took place, what was different, and what impact did that have? And so let's hear the, the penalty and then discern together what, uh, what caused this penalty. So it says in verse 12, But the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, because, here's this, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring the community into the land I will give them. Because you didn't trust me enough to honor me, you don't get the promised land. The people will still get the promised land, but you won't get the promised land. You're still going to get to live. Not a minor deal. Good thing. But you're not going to get to see the promised land. You're still going to get to lead the people. Also not a minor thing. But you're not going to get to get to the promised land. Because you did not trust me enough to honor me. So in what ways did he not trust? In what ways did he dishonor? How can we clarify what took place here? The first thing is he was disobedient. He was disobedient. God gave very specific instructions and he disobeyed those instructions. I think it's, it's, it's radical. He was given a charge to speak to a rock, which might seem really mundane, maybe even humiliating, not grand in any way, shape, or form. But he's to speak to the rock. And instead he speaks to the people. And what does he say to the people? You rebels. You're rebels. Must we bring water from this rock? So he's disobedient. God told him to speak to the rock, not to the people. And he spoke to the people. Second thing is, he hit the stone twice. 
And that might be reasonable for Moses. Moses did that before. It was a really cool deal. He struck the rock, boom, water. Can you imagine that? Have you seen, have you seen paintings of this scene in Exodus where the water gushes from the rock? It's magnificent to imagine that water that will, that will uh, quench the thirst of hundreds of thousands of people, the people and their children and their livestock. Don't forget the livestock. All of them have water. It's a magnificent thing. And so it's reasonable for him to want to strike the rock again, but he wasn't told to strike the rock. And the scriptures don't tell us this, but in my spiritual imagination, like he's in that moment and he's like, ah, rebels, must we bring this water? Boom. And he like, like standing there proud, like something just happened. And then he realized nothing happened. Like it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that there was a moment between, but that's, that's in my head because of all that we understand about the penalty and, and what his heart was in, in misalignment with God that he struck it and nothing flowed. And then he struck it again and God showed mercy on him even in the midst of his disobedience and water came forth. So he was disobedient, that fir- that's first. The second is I believe Moses was self-centered in this disobedience. He was focused on self. He took his staff and he now appreciated all of the glory of his position. The thing he once didn't want, now he greatly appreciated that people honored him and revered him and he stood before the people. And rather than saying, must God bring water from this rock? Must you not learn to, uh, why haven't you learned to trust in God? What does he say? He says, must we, me and Aaron, as we stand here, must we, your leaders, provide for you? And he stands in that place with a proudness in his posture. And he says, look at me and what I could do. And rather than humbly speak, he slams his staff into the stone He is misaligning the people. He could not lead the people into the promised land because if he led them into the promised land, then the people would have lifted him up as God rather than worshiping the one true God. Moses participates in the very same sin that gets us here over the course of Scripture. That sin that we find with Adam and Eve where the serpent comes and says, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to be like God? Of course you do. Yeah, give me that fruit. I'm in. I want to be like God. Or like when they're at the Tower of Babel and they're building their their own glory so that they could have a tower that reaches the heavens because they not, not only want to be equal with God, they want to supplant God as the ones that would be honored. This is a part of our original sin where we want to be God. And Moses comes into that same exact space in this same exact moment. And he can't enter the promised land because if he did, then people would look to him as the provider rather than God as the provider. And it requires a special source of humility in each and every one of us to follow God's will. And avoid the arrogance that can so quickly threaten our actions. Moses was disobedient. Moses was self-centered. Moses was also distrusting. Moses was distrusting. Let me tell you a little bit about the area of Kadesh that they were in whenever, uh, whenever Moses struck this rock twice when he was told to speak to the rock. It's a limestone area that's very porous and there are plants that grow on the sides of the limestone because there is water contained inside the rock. There are Bedouin people still living in this area of the world today that know that if you crack open the rock, you can provide some water for you or your people. And so this would have been something that the people of God would have encountered through the the natives in that area, through the Bedouin people that have existed in that territory for thousands and thousands of years. And they would have known this as a, a, a way in which they could provide for their families with water. And so when Moses comes and strikes the rock, he is ignoring what God is trying to do. God wants to be sure that they understand that he is the one providing. He tells them to speak speak to the uh, Moses to speak to the rock so that it is not broken open so it is not the way of the people but it is the way of God so that they're not providing for themselves but God is providing for them and Moses doesn't trust God enough to speak to the rock just as 
God prepared. If Moses would have spoken to the rock, then the people of God would have seen that it's God who provides. Not the understanding of native people, the understanding of limestone and porous rock that was part of that community's tradition. Moses was disobedient, he was self-serving, and he was distrusting. And so his penalty is aligned. What a beautiful thing that God shows mercy and says you could live, that God shows mercy and says you could still lead, but he can't lead them into the promised land because he needs to align his heart more towards God. And the people of God have to see God as the one who is the provider. So what is this for us? These are two stories, two situations that are very similar that give us a little sense of deja vu as we read them back to back. And it's meant to do that. We are meant to see this. We're meant to be so familiar with the Torah, the first five books of Scripture, that as we begin in Genesis and run through Exodus, we hear the story of the water from the rock. And when we come to Numbers chapter 20, we're like, what? This already happened once before. The people of God had already received this witness. This is to draw our attention to the distinction. And so let's see what it means for, the, for, for God to desire his people to be consistent in their choices. I believe for us today, we are called to be consistent in our choices. Now, you might say that these two things are different. God wanted different things, so that's not quite consistency. Correct. But God wants us to be consistent in our pursuit of him as we make our choices so that our life and our actions will align with God's will for us. We need to learn to to obey God's word, to to understand that God's word is relevant to us, as as relevant to us today as it was 2,000 years, 3,000 years ago, that God is alive and working in our midst through the power of his word, that we're to come at uh, this work of, of living in the world with humility, understanding that we don't have it all together, not seeking to supplant God, but to know that we serve God. And if we could get that alignment corrected and be consistent in it, then our choices will follow after God more and more faithfully. And we are to consistently trust in God. Consistently trust in God. That's so difficult to do because we will have trouble in this life. And every time and at every turn that we face trouble, we will be tempted to distrust God and find and place our trust in something else. Let us align our actions consistently faithfully after God's good, holy, pleasing, and perfect will so that as we consistently follow, we will consistently give him all the glory, honor, and praise he is due both now and forevermore. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, what what an extraordinary gift it is to be able to dig into your word together and understand how beautifully intertwined your story, story of salvation for the world is from beginning to end, from creation to new creation. Lord, we have the same temptations in us that, that have been there from the beginning of the world. And so we come humbly, humbly asking, Lord, that you would restore and redeem us, your people, that we would receive the blessing of your presence so that we could be consistent in our pursuit of you. Lord, we thank you that the faithfulness of our foremothers and forefathers communicates faithfulness for us and that the failings of our foremothers and forefathers does the same. So today we ask, Lord, that we would learn. Learn what it means to walk after you. 
Lord, as we continue in worship and we enter into this time of, of offering, we pray that you would bless these gifts and bless the givers as well, that all that is done in this space and time brings glory, honor, and praise to your name, that more would know the gift of grace we have in your son, Jesus Christ, the provision that we have uh, through, through you, the, our heavenly Father, and the, the work of your Holy Spirit in our midst. Lord, we pray that you would use these gifts for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the ushers come forward for this morning's offering? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins. We're going to leave a moment of silence so you can be with the Lord and ask for peace. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and you spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. And he broke the bread. And he turned to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you as often as you gather together. Do this in remembrance of me. And so when the supper was over, 
he took the cup and gave thanks to you again. Then he turned to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So we ask, oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these, your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now we join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those who are assisting come forward at this time? This morning we'll receive the sacrament of Holy Communion by approaching uh, the ushers will direct you to one of three stations. If you come with your hands held open, you'll receive uh, the sacrament. If you come with one hand, you'll receive just the juice and the wafer. If you come with two, you'll receive bread and the juice as well. There's a gluten-free station to your left of the altar if you have that need. Each of us are invited to spend time in prayer at the kneelers, meeting with the Lord as we grow in our relationship to Him. This is not covenants table. This is not a United Methodist table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And since it's his table, each and every one are welcome to come. All has been prepared. Would you come at this time?
Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him! Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for this gift of bread and juice that blesses and sustains, that fills us up when we're empty and equips us for the work of ministry. And we pray, oh God, that you would help us to be consistent, consistent in our obedience, consistent in our humility, consistent in, in the ways in which we honor you and trust in you all our days. Lord, be glorified in our day-to-day -day lives so that, we, so that as we go forth from this place and we worship you on Monday through Saturday, you would be glorified just as you are on Sunday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.